it's difficult to find the time to attend an event in the middle of the day, so I really appreciate that you could come. Uh, please feel free to grab something to eat at any time if you still haven't had lunch. Uh, but I especially want to thank Peter uh, for accepting our invitation. He's having a lot of different acts and events in New York and the U.S., so thank you so much for taking the time to come. Uh, oh, yeah. So today, Peter is uh, presenting the workshop editing a translation, the case of the great novel by Joseph Ka, that I'm sure you know is one of the main masterpieces in Kadma. Please return to Kadma. Um, and will be published in English for the first time next month in April uh, by the New York Review of Books, translated by Peter Bush. Um, Peter Bush is a translator of Spanish, Portuguese, and Catalan from the United Kingdom. He was the director of the British Center for Literary Translation and also a professor of literary translation at Middlesex University and later the University of East Anglia. He is a translator of a number of books, including Tirano Banderas uh, by Valle Clan, La Celestina by Fernando de Rojas, La Plaza al Diamant by Marcelo Dureda, or Mil Cratins by Kim Monzo. Uh, this year, uh, in 2014, Bitter Life, another classic by Joseph Pla, will be published also uh, with the translation by Peter Bush. Um, so we're very excited for this workshop and having you here. And, uh, thank you and please uh, join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jose, for the invitation and Elsa for the invitation. And uh, both from the Institute Ramon Rue and the Rue de Reda Cathedra for the support in my visit. Uh, well, I've given, I've given out some, I, I, will, I will talk in general about the translation, and, uh, and then we could look at some of the edits. So I think it's very interesting to see how, you know, kind of how translation kind of works in practice. Um, basically, I. <clears throat> when I was, at, I moved to Barcelona 11 years ago uh, from, from Norwich and uh, I decided when I moved that I would um, look forward to translating Catalan literature now that I was kind of moving to Barcelona and that um, I would also hope to translate more classics uh, because before when I was director of the British Center of Literary Translation, it's kind of full time academic job but also a full-time activist job because I was organizing things about translation throughout the UK um, with, the, with the center. Um, that I decided I would go back to the London to London every year for the book fair in order to, to maintain visibility with publishers, um, to, to throw ideas at them and for them to throw ideas at me. And in one of those visits to the London Book Fair I met I had a, an appointment with Edwin Frank, the editor um, of, the, of the series of the NYRB Classic series, and I gave him like eight titles of things I would like to translate. The Grey Noble wasn't one of them. Um, I never heard anything from him for a year, and then I went back the following year, and he said, why don't you translate Tirana Banderas? Um, and I said, yeah, why don't I translate Tirana Banderas? Why <laughs> 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 not? Um, it hadn't been translated since 1929. So I, tra I, I did translate that. And when, when I was kind of trans uh, in, in, uh, working on, on, on my own plan, he sent me an email and said, he said that we've just signed the rights to translate, uh, to do a translation of the Grey Notebook that I've got down in Greece. Uh, could you suggest anybody to translate it? So I wrote back and said, yes, I can translate it. Um, and so I, I eventually kind of, I signed a contract and, and uh, started on the translation after I finished it out there. So it's been a long, I mean, it's, it's, it's been sort of over four years at least that I've been translating uh, quite a breeze. And what I, I, I titled this workshop The Final Edits because I think that, well, that was an interesting focus. Uh, with, with this, every, every translation is an adventure. Um, you never quite know kind of, um, what the challenges of the translation are going to be until you actually get into it. 
and then you're never quite sure how the editing is going to go. Um, and with this book, um, it was kind of like last year, really, I, um, the, the, the final edits were, 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 were started. And, and often in the English speaking world, when you're working for a, a publisher, the publisher doesn't know the language that you're translating from. It's very unusual to be working with a publisher who knows the language that you're translating from, because very few publishers nowadays, and very few publishers know any other languages but English. Uh, sometimes they know French, occasionally they know Spanish. Um, I translated last year, and it was published last year, La Passa del Diamant by Lurena in Diamond Square in my translation. And there I was fortunate because actually my publisher at, uh, at Virago, my editor, knew Catalan, had studied Catalan, so that was, an, that was a great experience. But with, uh, with Edwin Frank and Susan Barber, who are my editors at uh, the New York Review of Books, they, they didn't know Catalan. They had some knowledge of Spanish, um, and they read French. Last year, a new translation into French came out in Greece with uh, Gabi Mar. So they had the French translation to look at. And they also had the Spanish translation of the MSU of the record, uh, which came out um, in a new edition of the not so long ago uh, with a uh, edit with a forward by Carlos Casaduan. Um, and there was another complication which was, it was a new edition of El Quadre and Greece was published with 5,000 changes. So my, when, I, when I came to my final edits, I was looking at the edits of my editors of the New York Review of Books. Because they were reading the French and the Spanish, I had to, you know, I had to be kind of looking at the French and the Spanish. And because there was a new edition with 5,000 changes, I had to be looking at that in order to see whether the changes that had been introduced had any implications so it was quite a complicated process of, in, in, in the editing in terms of what I had to do and what I had to kind of be looking at. Usually when I'm translating a book, uh, a classic that has already been translated into French or other languages that I know, I don't look at the other translations until I'm on my final edit uh, because I think it would be a distraction to look at the other translations until that point. So what I've been, uh, um, have you all read that about Andres? Have you? Yeah. Everybody's read that about Andres? Una tria. Pardon? Una tria. <laughs> Una tria. Uh, anyway, just to say that I think it's, it's one of the great works of autobiography written in any language that, that I have read. I, mean, I think when, when, I, when I read it for the first time, I thought, now, what a great book, and why has this book never been translated into English before? Um, and I'm, I'm now translating my Vida Amaru, which in fact won't be published until spring next year. Uh, and, I, I, and again, when I read those short stories, I thought, you know, again, what wonderful stories, and why haven't they been translated? And why, does no, why do people not know who Josette Black is outside of Catalonia? This has to do with publishing, it has to do with the visibility of different national cultures. It also has to do with the ambiguous role, I mean, the, the way that Josette Platt is seen within Catalan, Catalan culture by different critics. Um, but I think, you know, in the English speaking world, only 3% of what is published, less than 3% of what is published is, is translation. And so the, there is a lack of knowledge of. Uh, <coughs> of other cultures and other literatures. I also think that, that um, I mean, I, I've become to realize this over the last 11 years, um, you know, being somebody that started studying Spanish literature and to be aware of Catalan culture in the 1960s, that there really is, and I, I mean, Catalan literature, uh, I, I think Catalan literature should be compulsory for all those who are reading Spanish literature. I mean, I think everybody learning Spanish should, should have to learn Catalan. Um, because uh, I, I think that Catalan, you know, Catalonia, economically and politically, 
is crucial, whatever you think about independence, is crucial to Spain and has been um, since the Middle Ages. Uh, and just a detail, you know, the Spanish publishing industry is based in Barcelona. So everything, you know, I mean, there are, there are a few publishing houses in Madrid, but basically, historically, Barcelona has been the home of the publishing industry of, 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 of Spain, and so on and so forth. I don't need to labor this point, but um, you know, how do you understand the Spanish Civil War from the point of view of literary representation if you haven't read In Cerda Gloria? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, in the English-speaking world, you know, one gets tired of the fact that, the, the, the within, in terms of literature, the, the Spanish Civil War is Hemingway or George Orwell, um, who are the, the reference points. So even like um, a few weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Review of Books, and it was like a homage to a homage to, to George Orwell yet again. Um, so, I mean, I, I, there are, you know, um, these are my thoughts on, on the situation in Catalan within the academy and also within the kind of the view of world literature exists at the moment. And I think it's going, to, it's, it's going to be changing because so much Catalan literature is now being translated into, in, in, into English, uh, both contemporary and classics. And uh, hopefully the, 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 these translations will get the visibility that they deserve. Anyway, um, I thought it would be interesting to, to look at two passages in particular. One is a passage, um, if you look, um, the, the, the opening pages, the, the opening page of the Quadra in Greece, uh, <coughs> the 8th of March. Um, there is so much influence uh, about the language forced to close the university. Have you got that? Um, this, this edit that you have here is the edit from Edwin Frank, the edit my editor. Okay? And I, I'll just make a few comments, and then you could kind of ask me questions, and then we'll look at a page which is mainly my edit. Is very, which is quite good, which is the one about I drink coffee. Have you got that? Yeah, I drink coffee. So we will start with one in about the influenza. I mean, I don't know if you're, uh, you're, you're aware that, I mean, it starts where he says that the university is being closed down and it's my birthday. And, and this first, the, the first entry of the diary um, is about a little birthday party that his parents have organized for, uh, for him in, uh, in, in Calais. Um, kind of incidentally, the, the university wasn't closed down at this time, it was closed down later. So, you know, this autobiography is part autobiography and it's part fiction. Um, Plath introduces things um, in a way that he's thinking about how is. I want to make this autobiography interesting to read. So it's a, it's a, it's a mixture of memory, of real memories, of real autobiography, and an imagination of fiction. Now, I think all, autobiograph all autobiographies, to a certain extent, are fictional because the you know, choices are involved. Um, I think with Platt, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I mean, it's very imaginative. And uh, I mean, Dante Pucci in the introduction says that, I mean, he kind of puts the emphasis on, on plan and his adherence to memory and to reality, but I think that the, the imagination is just as, is, is just as important, if not more important. In, and in the introduction to La Vida Amarga, uh, <coughs> Platt says he thinks that all of his work are basically thousands of pages of memories mixed with imagination. With, with stories in La Vida Amarga are all told as if the narrator is flat and it's all happening, it's all happened to him and he's telling you what's happened. But, and part of it is real, but part of it is imaginary. Anyway, I'll, I'll just make a few points about the translation and the edit. Um, and you've got the French there, those of you who know French, and you've also got the um, <coughs> you've got this, this Spanish. And you've got the, the final the final version of that's actually in here. Um, there is so much influenza about 
that they have been forced to close the university. That was my first translation of the first sentence. My editor says, I mean, suggests going around and uh, the university has been closed. Um, now, going around, I, I didn't like going around because I thought it was too colloquial um, for that first sentence. I, I didn't. So I kind of stuck to about. Uh, so in the final version, it's about. Um, the university has been closed, but I didn't change that. Uh, but I, I, I thought that it was important that it, there was this sense of the authorities had to close the university. So I wanted to maintain that, so I, I maintained that. Um, well, we'll move on. Um, when it is time for desserts and lunch, uh, Ed, Edwin suggests putting out lunch at the beginning. Well, I kind of went, went along with that. And then we have golden sponge cake coated in very fine sugar, I know. And he suggested with a dusting. Of uh, very fine of, of sugar. This is in the in the second paragraph, right? Have you got that? And then it became <coughs> dusted with powdered sugar. Uh, that was another edit, uh, 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 and I didn't like the kind of repetition there of the idea of the dust and the powder. It's kind of redundant, really. Um, and there's a, in in all of this there is uh, there is the play between American English and British English. Um, that's there in the first sentence because <clears throat> in American English you would, you would say not close the university or shut the university but close down the university or shut down the university. Um, I mean not that it's a problem for American readers I don't think. I think you know my, my, my take on the American English versus British English is that American readers they used to read, I mean, American readers who read NYRB classics are used to reading English, UK English, I, I don't, literary English. So I don't think it's a problem, or vice versa. Um, I can see that, you know, what, what makes the spelling changes necessary. There may be words that are, are kind of not, uh, I mean, a common word, I mean, the sidewalk, pavement, elevator, lift, uh, fag end, but, uh, the cigarette butt, um, but I don't think that, for me it's not a great it's not a great issue. And uh, in the American, in the kind of um, my editors didn't think it was a, a, a tall problem um, that, that I was writing in, 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 in UK in UK English. But in relation to the dust and sugar, my what I had in, in what I really wanted to put was icing sugar. Do you know what? The, Apparently, Americans don't know what icing sugar is. Um, you don't know what icing sugar is. Well, it's that kind of that light sugar that you do, you sprinkle on the top of your cake. You know, when my mother made cakes, she put icing sugar on. So the, icing, the, the icing on the cake. The icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> and the expression exists. But it's like powdered sugar. But it's powdered sugar. It's powdered sugar. So 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 anyway, I I um, um, anyway. And, and I have very fine sugar because actually it's in the Catalanic in Grab it's um, yeah. in Grab. Yeah. No, anyway, that that uh, uh, so that that was the kind of uh, an issue. Um, I, I used the word creme brulee, a large dish of creme brulee, um, which is um, um, Pat doesn't say crema catalana; he says crema cremada. Um, and it's a large dish that is a communal dish for the whole family. It's not these small round things that you get nowadays. For grandma, for grandma, for grandma. Anyway, to go on, uh, the next paragraph. Um, as only saints days are celebrated in this country. The presence of the sponge cake and creme brulee put me on my guard. Now, saint stones. Um, how, how does one put? I, I left it as saint stones. Um, the French translator. If you look at the French translation, you'll see that the French translator has explained this. The French translator has put "Étant donné qu'en Catalogne on ne fête jamais les anniversaires, mais seulement les saints." So the 
the, the French translators made it explicit that Pais is Catalonia. And has also made it explicit that the celebrations are birthday, and, and, and that they what one celebrates in Catalonia are the saints' days and not birthdays. So he kind of explains that, the, 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 the French translator. I didn't want to do that. Um, and my editor um, wanted, instead of hanging in this country, wanted to say hereabouts. Because obviously El, pa El País or El País in Spanish or Le Bay in French has a level of different meanings. It can mean the local, the locality, it can mean the nation, um, <clears throat> it can mean the region. Um, but I think uh, Platt, my, my, my feeling about this is that the Platt uses Al, Al País deliberately in this book because he's referring to Catalonia. He's not putting Catalonia, but he's, he means Catalonia, it certainly doesn't mean Spain. The word Spain, I don't think, appears in this book. The word Spanish does, or Castellan. Um, and he uses Al País throughout the, through, through, throughout the, I mean, like 600, 650 pages. So on the whole, I have translated Al País as the country. Um, once or twice when it's obviously meaning the, the, the kind of locality around your food or Palafrugel, I've said local. But on the whole, I've, I've kept to El País. And it's interesting that in La Vida Marga, he carries on referring to Al País. And it's quite clear that what he means by Al País is not Spain, but it's Catalonia. And it's quite, it's quite clear. And I'm sure that is a deliberate, it's a deliberate um, stylistic decision on the part of, on the part of Black. <coughs> Uh, well, there are, there are other changes, but um, those, those are the kind of things that I thought you might, you know, that, that are interesting to, to, to look at. I don't know. Um, you, haven't had, you haven't had the opportunity to read these beforehand, so I don't know I mean, if there's any, anything else that kind of comes to mind as you look at these texts now. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, well, please don't ask questions. Because, because you know, know this, is, this is absolutely fascinating yeah. to me for many different reasons. I'm sure. <laughs> Obviously one of them is well, the whole laboratory of translation and yeah. how you deal with your with your editor, how you deal with the, the two languages separated, or two countries separated by a common language, yeah. and so on and so forth. But I, I, I was wondering more in particular too about, about some choices that you make here that are actually more than translation. That they are, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm no, sure no, you no, get no. this all the time. No, no, like, no, but, no, but, but so I shouldn't raise my eyebrows. No, 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 raise your eyebrows. I'm ignorant, so what yeah. do I know? Yeah. But, but the thing, the, the thing that I see here, for instance, sometimes is how do you translate? Is the, 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 is the question is only Michelinix's uh, question when he writes about the poetic tradition, right? About the rhythm. Yeah, and yeah, about yeah. what all that rhythm and yeah, yeah. and yeah. here it's very clear in the, in the examples that you gave us. For instance, when you say when this 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 text, a lot of those postures that in that appears in a table in a gram plata de crema cremada y un pasa y un pata pasito delicioso. This is rhythm, but this is also alliteration. Yeah. La crema cremada y el pata pasito delicioso. Yeah, yeah. This is all about a rhythm and alliteration. Yeah. Which the, the French translator has absolutely get rid of. Like, he, 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 he could have said, and correct me if I'm mistaken, something that is like, like, for instance, that you know, that you, you burned, yeah, you burned the, the yeah. cream, he, or, or to reproduce some sort of alliteration there. Um, and there are questions of rhythm that, in a way, as I said, are, how, what do you do with that, right? Like, for instance, another another important. You 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 already mentioned the question with the pulsing the supreme gravity, which yeah. is very clear to me. And and yeah. how do you deal with this with your editor at the same time? But the other the other one is also very clear in the in the previous paragraph. No año pas Barcelona y menos la universidad. La vida va popular amb els amics que hi tinc m'agrada. Yeah. Where, whereas in, in, in English and in French is 
j'aime la vie au village avec tous les amis qui s'y trouvent, or uh, uh, I like small town life here with my friends. So this, this, this promoting the I like Mariana yeah. and changing the focalization of the, of, the, of, the, of the sentence from la vida de popular to I like, you know, is, is, is that something that, uh, that uh, you know, is problematic to you? How do you deal with this? What are the questions that you ask yourself when you well, I think face these questions? Sometimes people say that the important thing with plan are the ends of the sentences. Right. right. Um, <laughs> so that Magrada comes right at the end of that first, right. uh, that first paragraph. But the, yeah, that, that <clears throat> but it may be that with, with uh, I mean, I, I, always, I always say that the translation is about imaginative transformation, yeah. literary yeah. translation. You have to, you're changing, and, and right from the, you know, in the first draft, even when, when you're reading it for the first time, thinking that you're going to translate it, you're thinking about how you're going to trans transform it, what are the issues at stake. And it may be that, um, you know, you change the structure of the sentences, because the rhythm of, of, of the rhythm of the, 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 of the, of the Black and Catalan can't be transposed into English like word for word, because literary English has different rhythms. But at the same time, one wants to have a style that is kind of distinctly flat as opposed to um, or, or, or Sales or Gudereva. Um, so it seems to me that when, you know, the process of literary translation is a process of interpretation and imaginative transformation, and that as you're doing the successive drafts of the translation, you're, you're kind of reaching towards what is your interpretation of the style. You're refining it and you're making it um, more precise and more exact, um, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, well, it has to be culturally understandable for the reader as well. I mean, if you say... What do you mean by culturally understandable? Well, if you have correspondences between, you know, what, uh, in this case, Pla, I would say, I would take the example of Crema Cremada. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, you have a tall correspondence in French, and come in with work because it's too colloquial and if you want to be you know, I mean it wouldn't work for the reader in French so you can't reproduce the alliteration that you have in Catalan but then you get a perfect sense of what it is in the target language right? so you have to make a choice well yeah I mean Crem Caramel and Crem Brulé are not the same thing no I, I know but you yeah. have to culturally I mean um, if you think about how yeah, it was interesting in, in uh, Kent, uh, Kent, uh, Kent State that uh, one of the students got really worked up about the fact that I put creme brulee. And I, th I think, I mean, having thought about it, I think what that student was saying, well, why didn't you say creme catalana? Yeah. Um, and then I would have said, well, Platt doesn't do creme catalana. And, and the fact is that he's not, you know, if you think about creme catalana you know, nowadays, you, as I said, you think about that little round uh, dish with the crema catalana. We're here. It's not a little round dish. It's a big dish that's put in the center of the table, and everybody helps themselves. We're talking about, you know, Palafrugel in 1918. We're not talking about um, uh, set portas in uh, in 2014. Um, so I didn't have any problem with using creme brulee rather. Than I mean, I have used Catalan terms and uh, Spanish terms within within the translation when I thought it was appropriate. But here, I thought creme brulee was. Yeah, but what I meant is that yeah. you're losing, you know, just to enter in the discussion. That in in in, in Catalan, you have this uh, play with the sound of the word crema cremada that you're losing when you translate creme brulee, but you gain in the target language by using creme brulee. You gain. Um, Something that is more understandable for the reader. That's what I meant. So uh, it's, it's a process of translation here. Yeah, I don't think it's been nice. No, no, I think I think no, absolutely what you're right. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but this student in Kent State would probably argue that crema catalana is understandable because so many people go to Catalonia and they they know what crema catalana is. And I would say, well, yes. 
lots of people from the UK and the US go to Barcelona, but if you have a reader in India, they won't necessarily know what Kerma Catalana is, but they'll know what Kerma Brazil is. But who knows? I mean, these are things that. Um, I'd like to. There's a difference between the French and the English in terms of. Uh, he like, I like small town life. J'aime la vie au village. Well, is Calilla, the is Palafrugel a village? I think it's more a small town. That's why I translated it as small town. Because you know, well, it was a relatively important town in terms of the cork industry, and there was the fishing industry. So it's not, you know, for me, a village is too small. Um, and that's why I, I said small town. And Poplar, well, I mean, Poplar, you can translate it as village. It's not a, I mean, it's not a bad translation, but I just thought that, that, that it, for me, it's more he likes small town life rather than village life. Well, I think the French translation is not really good here because okay. they may, I mean, they make it specific. Oh, oh, it's very, um, you know, they wanted to make it specific because by saying j'aime la vie au village, they're saying I like life in Palafrugia, not I like small town life. Yes. But, you know, if not, they would have said j'aime la vie du village. Which is what the captain says. Yeah. Actually. So yeah. I don't know if it's, you know, they wanted to give this specificity of I like uh, la vida de popla, de popla, de popla. Well, um, what's the Spanish? Um, yeah. La vida de pueblo. La vida de pueblo. Yeah, yeah, pueblo. decisions you have to take when you're translating. I mean, every word, every cluster of words, it's kind of lots and lots of decisions that you're making all the time. Uh, sometimes, there, in this opening paragraph, um, <clears throat> there's the issue of, I mean, he uses small sentences, but I mean, this is very important with Plow, but he deliberately uses small sentences because he's kind of, he wants to write against the Catalan that was more um, refined, well, not more refined, but the, the kind of old fashioned Catalan that was more kind of rhetorical and long sentences. He was kind of in reaction against that. He wanted a, he wanted a Catalan that was kind of more supple. Um, and so he uses, I mean, there are long sentences, but he uses small sentences, but short sentences as well. So it's important to, um, to, to, to keep the small sentences wherever possible. I'm trying to do. Um, so when do you <coughs> choose to write a footnote? Uh, like for Crema Catalana, you could have yeah. chosen Crema Catalana and, and then explained in the footnote. Um, well, I'm curious about that. Right now, that's a good question. Essentially, um, I, as a literary translator, I don't like footnotes. I think footnotes are like an admission of defeat. And I think that uh, you know, this is a long, a long work. Um, it has, I mean, we discuss whether to have footnotes or not. Uh, the, in, in, in Catalan, it has no footnotes. In French, it has some footnotes, but not very many. And in English, there is not a single footnote. It's not just to do with things, the kind of cultural specific terms like food, um, there's also the names of all the writers, or the names of the places, um, and then there are the words in, in Spanish and Catalan that, uh, for, for card games, like Tresillo, um, which... Um, How do you translate Tresillo? Well, you don't like <laughs> Now, what do, we do, what do we do with all of these things? You know, Verdague, uh, Carnet, I've mentioned two of my editors. So the, I, what I haven't mentioned is the copy editor. Right at the end, you have a copy editor. And what does the copy editor do? The copy editor do was very useful. The copy editor drew up lists of all the names and all the foreign words used in the text. And what did this kind of amount to? It, it amounted to 16 pages with double columns. So really, when you talk about footnotes, you're talking about you know, the, each of those words on those 16 pages could have merited a footnote. 
because they are uh, literary historical terms, uh, foreign language terms, that immediately a British or a, U uh, or, a, or a US reader is not going to kind of understand. Um, but my feeling on, on the footnotes issue is this. A, a, an important work of literature reads in translation or not in translation should be read as it stands on the page. It should not need footnotes. And I'll give you two examples, which are my examples that I throw at publishers. Uh, the first one is A Hundred Years of Solitude. A Hundred Years of Solitude um, was translated by Gregory Bassett and has become the great modern classic of uh, Latin America which was translated into English. Not a footnote. It deals with uh, the history of, uh, of Colombia, uh, all kinds of fruits and trees and stuff there. No footnotes. And that was no barrier to readers. Readers throughout the world were able to read A Hundred Years of Solitude in English and realize that this was something that moved them. And uh, if they wanted to find out more about Colombian history or Colombian flora or Colombian uh, whatever, then you know they as readers can Google like anybody. Uh, or not Google, can go and look in encyclopedias in the 1960s when it came out in England, in the 1970s when it came out in England. Um, my other example is Ulysses. The U Ulysses in the Bodley Head edition, uh, which is the you know the the, 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 the edition of that, the, the true edition of, of, of Ulysses, the text of Ulysses has no notes. So in other words, what James Joyce, you know, James Joyce wanted people to read Ulysses like as it is on the page. Post, you know, there, there, are, there are hundreds of books that have been written about James about Ulysses. There are all kinds of interpretations. Well, you can read them if you like, but the the you know. I maintain, I mean, June Ulysses stands or falls on the reading, on your reading of it, um, or on your successive readings of it. It's, a, it's like a book that you read throughout your life, and at each reading, you, you know, different time in your life, you kind of see different things and understand different things. So my, um, this is, this is, you know, if you like, my 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 take as a, tra as a literary translator on the issue of, I mean. Very, very occasional, I'll put a footnote. Uh, very, very occasional. I mean, I think there is a difference. I've never read Ulysses, but uh, at least with 100 Years of Solitude, I think that there's less of a need for footnotes because it takes place while well, it is technically within Colombia. It's within this like profoundly sort of magical world. It's mag magical realism at its finest, you know? So I feel like as a reader, when you're going through the book, or at least when I read it, I read it in Spanish, but you know, you kind of go through and you encounter these names and you take it in as part of this magical world, mm -hmm. as opposed to something uh, like this, where it's taking place in reality mm -hmm. with very specific traditions. I think it's kind of a different perspective from the reader, and I think you're more apt to absorb these sort of things you don't, you encounter, you don't quite understand because it is a world that, at the core of it, doesn't quite make sense. But the Colombian reading. Um, years of solitude, we'll see all kinds of references to Colombian history in that, in, 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 or anybody who knows anything about Colombian, Colombian, Colombian's history will see though, we'll, we'll see these references in a hundred years of solitude. Um, so, you know, you can read books at different levels. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, and if you're reading Ulysses, you know, there, there are all kinds of historical in literary references in, 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 in Ulysses that make Ulysses what it is. And there will be those readers who are more aware of that of those things than others. Um, but you know, I do if think you, it's if a really take... approach with a different mindset, certainly. Like once you get through the first few pages, you sort of the you know the confines of the book are set, and you sort of realize that there is this magical thing. So you're more apt to have, accept these sort of mysteries as they come to you. I don't know how to explain that. Oh, um, there are many people who will say that you know, kind of they're, they're feeling that you know the whole magical realism about the years of solitude has been overplayed by them, by by critics and so on. But that's another that's kind of another issue. Um, no, but it's, it, I think it, it is it is inter interesting. Yeah, no, 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 when, no. when you start when you start reading Cien Años de Soledad, 
you don't know that there is magical realism. You just start you reading the into the novel. Yeah. One, one, one of the things, the most annoying things that I have experienced in my life as a reader is, for instance, those books in which the author is uh, uh, is so concerned about the number of, of local words that he is using. And I'm thinking, for instance, here about Salman Rushdie and, and Midnight Children, that he is he, he gives you a glossary. It defeats the whole purpose of, of, of literary craft, I think. The uh, one. Yeah, I mean, I, I translated, I don't know if you know the word, Karak Comedia. Yes, my, my book is, I translated that book. And, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that book is like a parody of, yes. uh, no, for, for of all kinds of uh, uh, literature, Spanish literature in particular, back to the Middle Ages. That most readers in English won't kind of recognize. Um, so I decided to put a kind of dramatis personae. I think it's at the beginning of the book or at the end of the book. Oh, you, do you mean in Goiti Solo's classical name? Goiti Solo's No, no, the, not the 15th century. Not the original one. Ah, okay, no, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought no. you had to translate no, 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 the first one. Goiti was... Solo one. And, and, and so, but I did, the, I did this dramatis personae in the spirit of Caracas Comedia, which is in the spirit of Paragon. Yeah. So that's. Um, another point. Uh, but just, I, I just kind of to come to think about the, the number of writers that we mentioned. Um, uh, basically, I think that when he mentions the the writers that he's discussing, uh, even if I mean most readers will not know who Verdaguer is, they will not know who uh, Eugene Dors is. They know nothing about them, these writers. But Plath gives you enough information about them for you to understand, really, what kind of writer they will be. And more importantly, to know what his opinion is of them. Because what's so important is really Plath's opinion of these writers. And if you have a, you know, a footnote, or a, you could have had a, like, you know, there could have been a, gloss, a, a kind of an end thing with, and I wouldn't have been opposed to kind of doing that, you know, but um, an end thing where you say, well, Verdegay, you know, you died, born, wrote this, that, and the other. But actually, those facts don't really make much, don't really say very much to a reader who hasn't read any of those works. What's important is what Platt said about Verdegay, not Verdegay himself. And then if somebody wants to read Verdegay, well, they can go and buy one of but it, it is a, a very important issue. Um, uh, but I, uh, <coughs> but should we look at the second, the second pa pa passage, which is very different? And, uh, the, the second passage is is uh, I I drink coffee. <laughs> Now, this is my header. I can't remember what number of headers it was in mine, but um, basically, um, we, my, my editor from the New York Review has only changed one word in this. Um, if you like, I'll read, it, I'll read my translation now as it was published, and, uh, and you could look at the, at the editor. Um, or the kind of that, or I drink coffee. I can't take my eyes off the window. I'm fascinated by the savagery of the wind over the sea. The water shimmering scales dazzle me. I bundle up well and walk over to the window. The beach is deserted, not a soul walking down the street. The boats painted apple green or red and the tar colored stripe look sad, shabby, and forlorn on the tawny gold of the sand. I shiver back to bed and slowly warm up. I think it must be fun to be in the sun and out of the wind. It is the season when oranges turn golden and almond trees splash their first coral pinks. Awnings are full of cats sunning their bellies, legs stretched out, one eye half shut. A kitten is always playing with a shadow from its tail or a wandering feather. I also think how on days like this, anglerfish soup tastes its best with toast, a spoonful of aioli, and wine from the unsung. I think about so many other things. Not for long, however. The window draws me close, bewitches me. Uh, well, you can see, I've changed, I mean, you know, that, 
we've got a long way from this draft to, to what was published. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I've made certain decisions in the translation in terms of the rhythm of the text, which I'll point out, and then you can you know, tell me what you think. Uh, fast enough. He uses the word fast enough in the in the third sentence, and it, the paragraph ends on fasting that. I, I deliberately decided not to have that repetition, because I think fascinating is, seemed to me much weaker in English than it is in Catalan, and that to, to have that repetition, I, I didn't think um, uh, <coughs> worked in English, so I changed it. Uh, and it took me a long while, you can see, I mean, I had I find a savagery of the sea, wind over the sea, uh, I'm entranced by it, and then at the end I've got the window drawn into it, fascinates me and really, I mean, I kind of, you know, you go through lots of permutations, what I'm saying, you, you're working through all this to get to what you hope will be the, like the, the final concentrated translation, when you feel that you've got the kind of essence of plan in, in, in English. <coughs> Not as you know, not a single soul is walking down the street. Pels carisma pasan y un Then I made that not a soul walking down the street, which is so is more colloquial, um, and I like the rhythm of that. The you know, beach is deserted, not a soul walking down the street. Um, I think plan plan plans. Well, as Catalan is very informed by colloquial Catalan, by Catalan in conversation, by the spoken rhythms of Catalan. Um, and it's very literary Catalan, but the, what he was trying to do was to make it a new con contemporary Catalan, and he wanted to bring the spoken rhythms into, into, into Catalan literature on a grand scale. And this is part of the, the success of the book in Catalan. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Obviously, <coughs> he's looking at the, I mean, he's looking at the sea, and he's looking at the beach, and he's looking at the, he's thinking about the, the, the kind of, you know, the orange trees and the almond trees, so it's a kind of seascape landscape uh, from the window. And I, <coughs> like, look at the, um, well, Les Calforeta en Retorna Lentamente. Torno al tremular, la escalcoreta en retorna lentamente. lentamente. Um, I shiver back to bed and slowly warm up. There I decided to bring those two, two sentences together. And of course, I shiver back to bed is something that you can't say in Catalan. I mean, even English, you know, English verbs have a way of saying things that, that they can't, you can't do in French, you can't do in Spanish, you can't do in Catalan. But you can do it in English, and that's why I, I made that. I made that change. You can shoot it back to bed in English. Then, uh, y als amigas tron als primeros rusas de curar. Almond trees, it is a season when oranges turn golden and the almond trees splash their first coral pinks. Now I use the verb that's not there in the Catalan, splash. Because Platt has brought the idea of the sea into the almond trees by referring to the pink as the pink, the, the coral, the coral pink, yeah? So I've kind of magnified that by bringing in the, the, the idea that the splashes of pink coral on the, the on, you know, kind of in his, in his vision here of the, of the, of the landscape, the spoken seascape. Um, that is, if you like, an imaginative transformation that the literary translators made. I took that decision, and, that, and, that, and I didn't take it necessarily consciously. I mean, this is something else I'd like to know, is that, <clears throat> you know, in translation studies and the discussion of translation, uh, often it's, you know, translation is a unique form of writing. Why is it unique? Because you're, you're rewriting somebody else's text. <coughs> and in, there's a long process of drafting and redrafting and research that you're involved in. And at some stages, I'm looking at the screen, I'm just looking at the paper, I'm not looking at the Catalan. And then I will be solely looking at the Catalan, comparing where I've got to in relation to the 
Catalan. And there are, you know, the, 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 a literary translator is a, is, a, is, a, is a writer, full stop. Um, because it, you have to have, you know, in that process, the, things will come to you spontaneously, apparently spontaneously. But that spontaneity is only, it, I mean, it's, it is spontaneous because you're not, you've not made a conscious decision to put splash in there. Suddenly, in your mind, the word splash emerges, and you think, oh, that works. But it might be that the, the word that spontaneously emerges doesn't work. You think of another draft, and you think, well, that's wrong. I don't, I, I don't want to go on. I don't want to take that part. But I always say to, to, to students who want to be literary translators, you've got to be bold as a literary translator. Because really, if you're translating Jose Platt, or you, you're translating Miguel de Durantes, or you're translating Juan Guaji Solo, you've got to think, well, I have got to write at the level of Juan Guaji Solo in English, or at the level of Miguel de Cervantes in English. And if you're going to do that, then you've got to be bold in terms of your writing in English and your interpretation of Platt and so, you know, Cervantes or whatever. Um, you've got to be able to let yourself go, in other words. As a writer, let him or herself go at certain stages in writing. I mean, I've worked a lot with Juan Guaji Solo, and I know how he works. I mean, he works, he writes everything. And he writes on kind of small uh, pieces of paper. Uh, and he can write a paragraph up to you know, like 12 times, and he writes them all out of my hand, making very, 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 very small changes. So, you know, even an, an original writer, in a sense, is a translator as well, because the original writer is translating him or herself, trying to arrive at the first set of words that's going to be the original that you're going to translate. But these words by Platt, or these words by Tango Kisolo, or by Juan Salas, are the result of lots of rewritings um, in themselves, where the writer has been moving towards what will be the final work of art that they've created. So in that sense, literally, the work of a, a creative writer, the original writer, and the work of the literary translator are, are parallel. Obviously, the difference is that here is, you know, in Catalan, a book that exists, or here is in Japanese, a book that exists, words on the page. You're, you have to change that. Uh, but there are, there, there are parallel kind of uh, parallel movements. Uh, you know, and I again there I, I changed the. Uh, in, in, in Catalan, a la sora, a la sora dos fos, la sembrancación, etc. The sound that comes at the beginning of the sentence, I change that to the end of the sentence because I felt that that um, worked better in the, with the rhythm of, uh, of English as opposed to the rhythm of Catalan. By and large, I would say that the the, for me, the most difficult part of translating Platt was, were the descriptions. He, had, he, is such a, he has such wonderful descriptions of the landscape, the seascapes, or the city, I mean, the, the descriptions of Barcelona. They are wonderful, and uh, that, they're, they're extremely difficult to translate. I know, than, than, um, because he had, I mean, he, he's not in this particular one, he's got such a sense of humor, and it's so ironic. Um, you know, some of the descriptions of the streets in Barcelona. He'll be walking down at Ramblas, and he'll, 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 he'll describe the, the green buds coming on the trees, and the light, and the clouds in the sky. And then he'll talk about the horrible smell coming out of the drains. So he's, I mean, he, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a, a skilled describer, a describer of landscapes and cityscapes, but they're very original. Because he, because he, he has this kind of ironic humour, which he brings into many of even the, these physical descriptions of that state. Um, anyway, perhaps you've got some other questions.
get away from the cat context and start like, writing, becoming a sort of Pierre Menard. <laughs> right? right. yeah. in, in a certain way, right? yeah. like, you, in a different language, obviously. And, and that this other translator who actually is creating the language, trying to understand the, the, the whole creative process. Right? Yeah. Uh, and at that, at that moment, that you, you actually uh, create your own rhythm based on the rhythm of the language yeah. that you're using, right? Uh, because because they, then when, when you look at the at the, at the text at the, at the Catalan text you can, uh, or perhaps I am obsessed with this you know, I, I keep no, looking no. looking at at these elements that of style of the let's say this new and this new at this at this at this, at this this creativity with the sound with the with the political with the etymological figures with all that yes. that that somehow you you you. They, they, they still are there in your in your version, but they are oh, they are not exactly in that particular sentence. They are somewhere else. Yeah. In, in a sense, you know, in the, the splashing of the coral and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. How well, there's the savagery of the wind over the sea, the water shimmering the sky. There isn't it? Right. Right. There. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. As you said, this is this. You know, it's it's. Literary translation is is literary writing. Yes, it's yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, how do you how do you translate? Uh, that's perhaps completely impossible to, to answer, but I don't know. How do you translate time in the sense that how do you translate the sixties or the fifties or? Okay. How do, you, how, do you, how do you translate the, the fact that he is writing in a time that is no longer here, that is no longer extant, that is uh, past, even when he writes? Well, I, I, I suppose immediately by trying to avoid things, words or expressions that are too contemporary. Okay. So you do that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, again, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because um, it depends what you want to do with the translation of the book that you're translating. Right. Um, uh, but yes, I, I would kind of not want to use something that is like ninety, uh, you know, slang that is used in the UK today by you know my children, my older children who are thirty. They have a particular way of, 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 of relating to music. And, Kinds of things, and they will use words, and I wouldn't want to. Some of these words are very kind of, you know, they they, they will disappear soon, but they're they're very linked to the here and now, and I think they they wouldn't have been appropriate in the translation of uh, of this book. If I was translating Goiti Solo, it might be different because Goiti Solo is always playing. You know, you get the medieval word, and he will use something from uh, from now, or he'll use something from like he, he's playing with all those kind of different levels um, in, a, in a very playful, it's very satirical and parody and so on. This is not the same, Platt's not the same. Um, and Platt's interesting in, in, in the introduction to La Vida Marga, he says to the reader, here I am describing Berlin in the 1920s or, or Madrid or Barcelona. These places that I've described have changed. But I, I'm not going to. I'm not changing my description. So right. right. they're going to stay as they are. And obviously, as a translator, you you, you kind of kind of try to keep that. Um, but does, does it seem that it also depends on the approach? I mean, if you're translating an old text, do you want it to sound old in English or you're trying? If you're translating, to, I know uh, a text from I don't know, 15th century, 16th century. Do you? That's how we're seeing it, for instance. Yeah, do you want it to sound like a, an English text from, from that time, or do you want it to sound like a modern text? I, I think that that's a you know editorial decision that, that mm -hmm. must be made. Both are yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm with the Thelestina, I, I wanted to... Um, basically, the Thelestina has tended to be translated into a kind of an archaic form. I mean, the contemporary translations of Thelestina tend to be translations into kind of an archaic English. And I, I think that's totally wrong. I think that the the originality of La Celestina when it was when 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 Fernando de Rojas wrote it was that it was this was something new in Castilian. 
So if you if if, if if you know if the if the if what was original about La Celestina was was that this was something new in the Castilian language, it makes no sense to, to kind of translate it into some pseudo Shakespeare in English. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, From the bottom of my heart. Thank so you. I so I I mean I decided I decided that, that I was going to tra I was going to translate against that tradition. Of translating. And it's very interesting if you read the James Mapp translation, which you should all read if you haven't read it. It's a wonderful translation, but I mean, he was translating something like 100 years, I think, after, after the first thing that um, was, was, was published. But uh, obviously, he, he's translating into Elizabethan English. And he does all kinds of things, like expanding the text and so on. But basically, you know, his, his, his English is more or less contemporary to, to, to Fernando Lopez, and it's wonderful. I mean, he, his wordplay is, is, um, is really adventurous, it's fun, um, and you never think when you're reading, uh, when you're reading uh, Map that this sounds archaic. I mean, it obviously is archaic to, to the modern reader, but you feel this is something that was original in English, English, in Elizabethan English, when Map was translating it. Um, and when my translation of the Felicina came, and when I and I, and I you know I, I said to my publisher, this is what I'm going to do, and my publisher had you know had no well I mean I took the idea of the, of the new translation to a publisher and I accepted what I wanted, what I was wanting to do with uh, with the Felicina. Um, and but at the same time, in the same year that my translation came out, Margaret says Peter translation of the Felicina came out with the Yale University Press. And she makes a very good and fantastic translation, but her she deliberately tried to recreate an archaic English. Which I think she does, you know, kind of very, very well. I think it's the best of the of the kind of, of, the, of that mode. Um, I also took the decision to take out the dramatic structure to to um, to the Felicina because I you know Fernando de Rojas never wrote that uh, book. To be performed as theatre, it was it was written to be read aloud by a by, to be read aloud uh, or to be read silently, but not to be staged. And there are so many translations of the Felicina are translations, you know, for the stage. And what do people say? It's, it's too long; you can't stage it. So what we'll do? And what, what did Calix Vieto do in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival? He cut the he cut out 55 percent of the text. Now, people in Edinburgh didn't, you know, that, that's not Fernando de Rojas. So, you know, all of these, you know, there are kind of strategic decisions that one has to take. Uh, and, uh, um, and then you have to, def you know, you kind of have to defend your strategy and what you've actually done in the translation, you know, when you're talking with editors and so on. I mean, the important thing is to have editors who understand through your translation what they, what you, what plan or Fernando Rojas are trying to do, and then they are editing in the spirit of your translation. Uh, and the, I had great the, the editors of the New York Review the books were great because they made lots of interesting suggestions that I adopted or didn't adopt. But they were, they kind of grasped what I was trying to do and what you know the flower that was coming through my translation. You know they, they kind of saw that and they were reading the French translation as well. And I think the French translation is heavily dependent on the Spanish translation. Because one of the things that I noticed when I was doing the final edit was I would sometimes play, I, I would sometimes I would all, be always looking at the French translation because I knew that they were using my editors were using the French translation, and there were certain things I thought, where on earth is this coming from? It's not there in the class. And where was it? It was in the it was in the Spanish translation. And again, you know, it's perfectly legitimate to do that. It's just that I had to take a decision about whether I I liked the moves that had been made by Ignacio Rivera. Whether that fitted with my translation, sometimes it's, it usually it didn't. Um, my, my style of translation and plan is very different to uh, with records. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, the, the kind of colloquial element I thought was very important in plan, and, uh, and so I, I kind of truly really tried to work at that. The other, the other issues, I mean, I haven't given you a, um, a, a third passage, which would have, um, but 
Platt is a great thinker. I mean, he is in the tradition of Montaigne. And Montaigne was one of his favorite writers. And there, there are um, entries which are pure meditation about death, about sin, about sex. Um, and it's often very difficult to grasp what he's really saying. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a very, I mean, he has a very um, precise, a very precise way of writing about ideas. But precise in the sense that he, he has a very co complex view of these things. And his precision is in describing the complexity. And that, you know, kind of, I found that, that, that translating his, his, uh, his meditations was, was, was that, that, that was very difficult. I meander for hours down the streets in the slums of Barcelona's 5th district, a hot night. Like so many, I leave home intending to give, up, give myself up to pleasure. However, after walking the streets for a while, I see only poverty, filth and suffering. The stench is stifling. For every pleasant person you see, you must withstand the presence of a thousand monsters. Yours truly, too, the doctors. The liquids on offer in the taverns. The food they serve up are disgusting. The brothels are unbelievably sordid. People are bitter, tense, and ready to lash out. It is depressing to see the extent to which they have managed to transform this world into the quintessence of all that is pleasant, unpleasant. It is impossible to imagine experiencing any pleasure at all if you don't have loads of money and a lively imagination to help you over the hurdles that always seem to present themselves. In this country, everything conspires on behalf of the sordid. Woe to the person who tries to act Grecian manner. And then he he's a great flaneur, he's great he's walking throughout the cities of throughout the city like kind of Walter Benjamin, uh, Baudelaire. From the outside these houses always seem new. It's all about the suburbs. The tiles on their side sidewalls are blood colour. They have been constructed according to current taste. But when you examine the detail at close range, you see how these houses tend to be the most forlorn and dilapidated in the area. They seem to have aged prematurely. They have grimy, filthy or broken windows with pages of newsprint held in place by glue. The washing hanging over balconies, dirty stairs, dripping walls, poverty crawling up to each floor, a sorry sight. These houses seem marked by the stigma of subversion in the dark twilights of winter. In summer, human life spills from doors and balconies. When it is windy and sunny, the clothing that thunders on the terraces is a single cheerful element. Barcelona is surrounded by the soft outlines of small mountains and hills, with a thin scattering of trees. The contours of the hills are sporadically adorned by the silhouettes of spindly, rickety pine trees that, against the light, occasionally look like the delirious shapes, look like delirious shapes, like a herd of phantom horses flying over barren earth. These miserable trees on the outskirts of Barcelona are hardly one of the most pleasant sights the city has to offer. In my imagination, the silhouettes of these gloomy, frantic pine trees have always accompanied the tall, sad, isolated houses on the city outskirts. Um, you know, it just has fantastic descriptions of the uh, kind of suburbs in the, in, in, in the late, in, well, just after the end of the first world. I mean, I, I, you know, when, when you read Platt, you think, um, and you compare Platt to the contemporary 
prose writers in Spanish. I mean, there's no comparison with it uh, in terms of literary value. And Platt was drawn to, I mean, he has pages on, on Athorin and Barocco. He kind of, he liked Athorin because he liked the short sentences and the descriptions in Athorin. And he liked Barocca because Barocca has that kind of rough, coarse edge to, to his prose. But Platt is kind of streets ahead in terms of, of the way he writes. You know, Athorin and Barocca are in a way minor writers. Uh, they're interesting minor writers, but Platt is an interesting, he's a major in any, you know, no doubt about that. Um, I mean, the way that he'll shift from a discussion of you know, a description of the suburbs or a description of the of the guy with the conch shell Gervasi. And the, the next entry would be talking about his reading Kierkegaard and his reflections on reading Kierkegaard. I mean, the, 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 his, 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 his mind, his intellect is so subtle and so able to kind of go from one thing to the next um, seamlessly in, in, in the grey which, which makes it a, a, such an original see how people respond to it. <laughs> anyway, any, any other questions? Well, you said that it was uh, challenging to um, to translate the, uh, the sense of irony. I mean, I understand that. It was, it was, uh, uh, was it part of the, the descriptions because it makes a uh, sense of irony and humor well, there's kind of movements from what is lyrical to kind of ironic. Right. That, that's quite unusual in, in the kind of description. I mean, he's, he's deliberately undercutting the kind of romantic views of the, of the landscape or, or romantic views of the city. You know? He's deliberately kind of undercutting that. But no, I, I, was think, I would think that the, well, what I was saying was really that the, the very, the kind of, that, kind of, that irony is quite, is quite difficult, but the, 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 the the descriptions of the university life, of the of the, of the lecture theatres, and the in, in the second, and they're hilarious. And it seems, it seems to me again that they're, they're some of the best descriptions of the level of universe, of intellectual life in Spain in, at the time. But it's a, uh, you will all be to, I mean, I can, some of that still exists. You know the the. The, the university lecturer who stands in front of a class reading a chapter of the book that he wrote. I mean, I, I, I was once in Salamanca University with a group of students, and I went, I went to one of the lectures that they were, were going, and, and the, the, the guy was there, he would get out the book, and he was reading from the book. But, um, I mean, I, I, say to, I say to people, you know, that there, there is this tradition of the university novel in English and American, both in England and, and US. I think that um, you know David Lodge, there's that there's Lindsay Anderson, I don't know if you know that was the, the film If, which isn't a university but it's kind of anarchy at school. And I think that the Plan's descriptions of university life are brilliant. I mean they're so funny. Um, I think they're, they're the most some of the most the, the most amusing pages kind of uh, describing um, pedantry. pedantry. Um, and yet, at the same time, um, there are also wonderful descriptions of the life of a student at the time. Because, of course, Platt, you know, when he first goes to the university, um, his, you know, in 1918, when he, when he goes back to university, he's staying on the Calle de Mallorca, Calle de Mallorca with uh, his parents, because they rent a flat there. Um, and, uh, and then his father has a financial disaster, so they're no longer they're bankrupt, and he has to move from you know, the parents go back to Palafrugel and, and he moves into very poor student accommodation. And, you know, and, and there are these descriptions of him studying in, in, in the freezing cold, um, where the, somebody from the local bar, the waiter brings up the coffee, brings the coffees up to the students uh, where, they're, where they're studying. And those descriptions, I mean, the whole vision of student life in 1918, 1919 in Barcelona, it's, it's, it's kind of wonderfully realistic. Um, and I can think of very few, you know, kind of novels where you have that sense of reality, but 
you and I think we have to look at, you know, some perhaps German, some German literature or, or, or some, some, some of the leading French writers, but I think, I think they're, 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 first, they're, they're, you know, they're brilliant. So all, and all of this is, is a kind of, you know, Plant was very much influenced by Stendhal. You know, it's the whole thing of like, literature is holding up a mirror to the world. And with all the imagination and the memory and these transformations, I mean, he is trying to do that, and I think he succeeds in doing that in, in terms of his book. People who read The Grey Notebook will begin to have some understanding of what it was like to live in Catalonia in 1918 and 1919. Um, and that is something that they can't get from Look at Joan Miro. They can't get it's something that you can't get from Joan Miro or, or uh, any, any or Picasso, or, let alone Dali. This is something that this is a unique thing that you can get from literature when it when it's written. It's like a comedy you men. It's like Balzac, but not Balzac. <laughs> if, if you see what I mean. Um, so hopefully people will buy it and read it. <laughs> And, and that you will teach, you know, I mean, that those of you who are teaching comparative literature or literature, world literature and translation, you know, it's, it's, it, it should be kind of key book in, in terms of uh, understanding Catalonia, understanding Spain, understanding, uh, getting beyond the cliches. Because he was a, I mean, he was a leading journalist. You know, people talk about George Orwell. Well, how do you compare George Orwell? I mean, how, how do we compare George Orwell and Giuseppe Plan? Well, I think Giuseppe Plan can stand at the level of George Orwell. But everybody knows of George Orwell because he was English. Um, nobody knows about Giuseppe Plan because he was Catalan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, interesting comments. You know, um, Juan Carlos Onetti said, uh, the, the, the interesting comment by Juan Carlos Onetti, he says that, you know, if Beethoven had been born in Tlaquara Bay, he would have ended up being the, the, the bandmaster in the town, and nobody would have heard of Beethoven. 